Hello everyone, my name is Pedro and I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Utrecht. I'll be introducing some of the basic concepts behind many body perturbation theory that you'll be seeing through this school. We'll begin by revisiting the many body problem within quantum mechanics and the difficulties that arise from it. And then we will move on to exploring Green's function theory from the definition of the Green's function to how to compute it. And finally, we'll talk briefly about what you'll be seeing in the coming lectures. As with many problems in physics, we begin with Hamiltonian. In a system with more than one particle, we can separate the Hamiltonian into two terms. The first containing only single particle contributions and the second with all the particle interactions. An interesting way to picture how the many body term changes the single particle picture is given in the book of Matuk. There, the single particle Hamiltonian is compared to an isolated horse running through a field. But the field is not empty, so while moving, the horse creates a cloud of dust around itself. And so the horse does not in fact move alone, but with the surrounding cloud of particles, making it a quasi-horse. Through this school, you'll be presented with a similar concept, that of the quasi-particle where electrons are no longer described as isolated particles, but will be addressed due to, to their interactions. The question is now how to study your system. Well, solving the many-body Schrodinger equation is extremely difficult, so you often need to choose an approximation that will sit somewhere between the fully interacting system and that of independent particles. When choosing your approximation, you have to consider how feasible it is and how close to the real system you can get. A commonly used approach is quantum density functional theory. In this framework, we switch from the main object being the all electron uh, wave function to the electron density. All quantities are assumed to be a function of the ground state density. So if you know it, you can compute whatever ground state property you need. Furthermore, we work with the quantum system of equations where all electrons follow Schrodinger equation under the influence of the quantum potential. This quantity includes all external potentials, the Hartree potential, and the exchange correlation potential. The later quantity is, has an unknown form, so it must be approximated. And while quantum density functional theory is extremely useful for ground state properties, it often fails when we have to go beyond and access excited state quantities, like the many-body quasi-particle gap and absorption. Here's an example of DFT's failure to compute the gap for bulk HBN. And as you'll see in the school, you can often improve DFT's results by employing GW and obtaining a better estimation for the quasi-particle gap. Now, the reason for the failure of DFT is that we went too far in our approximations. The optical spectrum of the quasi-particle gap are many body effects that cannot be fully captured with the system of independent particles. So we need to introduce back some of the particle interactions. You can try to visualize this by thinking about what happens when an electron is removed from a solid. So after the electron moves to a new state, it leaves behind a hole that others in electrons will see as a positive charge, leading them to move towards it. But the remaining electrons will also interact with each other and so the attraction felt by each electron individually and the whole will be screened. It is the screening that we must capture in our approximations to accurately compute the gap and optical properties. So at this stage, we have defined the problem we must study and we have seen the limitations of one of the most commonly used approaches. We have to now move forward into another approach that can in principle go beyond the limitations of DFT, Green's function theory. So we begin by motivating the expression for the Green's function. Think of a system where an electron placed at point R at time T that then moves towards point R prime at and time T prime. We can compute the transition probability as follows. So initially the state, the system was in the state phi naught. Then we create an electron at R which propagates in time from T to T prime and arrives at point R prime where it's annihilated. This is our final state, so we can get the transition probability by computing the scalar product with the initial state. And this would describe the electron transition between the two states in a material and lets us motivate the definition of the electron's Green's function. 
we can also define the Green's function for the holes by considering holes as moving backwards in time with respect to electrons. So first the hole is created by annihilating a state and then propagating the particle in time and creating a new state. These two expressions can be combined into the time order Green's function by using the time ordering operator T. And this is the function that we'll be using through the rest of this lecture. So a similar philosophy to DFT also applies here in that we can compute all properties from the Green's function using a general formula where you only need to know the operator associated with the quantity you want to evaluate. A simple example is the density, that is just a simple diagonal operator. But there's a lot you can uh, extract from the information of the Green's function's poles. And you can see this by doing the following. We introduce a series of complete Slater determinants of n plus one and n minus one particles. Then we take the Fourier transform in time and move to energy. And this lets us arrive at the Lehman's representation of the Green's function. So now what is inside this expression? In the denominator, you have the excitation energies of the n plus one and n minus one particle system and the chemical potential. Now for the chemical potential, we assume it to be constant when going from a system with n particles to either n plus one or n minus one particles. And in the numerator, you have overlap matrix elements. So when you plot the position of the poles in the complex plane, you'll find that below the chemical potential, you have the excitation energies for the n minus one system, while above, you'll see the excitation energies for the n plus one particle system. So information about the band gap can actually be accessed by analyzing the poles of the Green's function, which is what you're going to do in GW lectures. So, so far, we saw some of the more important properties of the Green's function and how they can be related to the quantities that we are trying to compute. But we haven't really discussed how to get the Green's function. So for this, we will be following the diagrammatic approach derived at the equation of motion for G. There are two important steps along this path. The first is to connect the interacting system to another whose Hamiltonian we can actually diagonalize. This can be the independent particle case, TFT, or any other case whose solution you know. And we connect the two systems by slowly activating the interactions and then deactivating them. During this adiabatic change, the state that we are propagating remains an eigenstate of our Hamiltonian that thanks to the gamma mu theorem. And this means that you can safely replace this expression in the Green's function and use the ground state of the known system. By doing so, we arrive at this expression for the Green's function. We see that we are already at a perturbation-like expression with a sum over several terms with different numbers of interactions. But this expression can be further simplified to use only the potential and the single particle Green's function. And we do this by employing Big's theorem. This is an important result that tells you how to simplify the sum above by replacing the full time order product by normal products of operators with different numbers of contractions. A contraction between two operators is defined as a difference between the time ordered and the normal uh, product. And thankfully, the expectation value of a contraction is just the expectation value of the time order product. Now there's some algebra involved, but if you use Dick's theorem in the expression for G, you arrive at the sum involving only the single particle Green's function and the Coulomb potential. And this is the fundamental idea behind the machinery of many body perturbation theory. So instead of dealing with a complicated process, we replace it by a sum over much simpler processes. And you can think of it with the following analogy. Imagine that you have a white ball that goes through a machine where it will be bombarded with different inks and then comes out with a different color. Now studying the full process will be too complicated so you can replace it by the following. First you consider a step where the ball is bombarded by blue ink and comes out as blue. Then you consider a two-step process where first the ball is bombarded with red ink and then blue ink. Then you move to a three-step process and continue on adding transitions with more steps. At the end, the sum over all possible transitions with different steps will have to be equal to the fully complex process. 
And so now taking all what we have learned into consideration, we can begin to look at the relation between the different terms in our perturbative expansion and their diagrams. Let's consider first the first order corrections to the Green's function, which are written as follows. And where U is the coolant potential and corresponds to an interaction between points three and four. Here we are using the following notation where, for example, the argument three means point R3 and time T3. Now the terms, the contributions A and B can be uh, depicted as follows. You begin with a Green's function connecting points one and two, so not interacting with the Coulomb potential. But then for A, you must add two Green's functions, each uh, starting and ending at the same point, three and four respectively. While for B, you have two Green's functions, one starting at three and ending at four, and another starting at four and ending at three. The remaining four terms you can actually see that right now you have a Green's function already connected to the a potential line. Now for diagram C, you can see it as a boson that the electron emits and later on reabsorbs. While for diagram D, you have a boson that interacts with another electron in a material. You can also see that the diagrams corresponding to E and F are in fact topologically equivalent to C and D. And this means that not all terms in your sum will be different diagrams and you only have to worry about diagrams that are topologically different. There's another kind of division that we can make between diagrams, that of connected and disconnected diagrams, with the first two being disconnected and the last two being connected diagrams. And as it turns out, in the expression for G, we can factor out the, the disconnected diagrams in the numerator and denominator, so we only have to deal with connected ones. For the mole, we can also distinguish between reducible diagrams and irreducible diagrams. So irreducible diagrams are those where we cannot uh, cut the Green's function line and still keep a valid diagram, while reducible diagrams, you can cut through a G line and reobtain a valid diagram in your expansion. So if you rewrite your sum using only the irreducible diagrams as a building block, you obtain something like this. Small side note here, I'm only using this kind of diagrams for simplicity. And now the double line represents the full interacting rings function. But you can also notice something else is that in the second term, you'll find the first order correction term repeated. And in the third order correction, you will find the second order correction repeated. So the equation is repeating itself, meaning that you will be able to rewrite it again in the following way. That the first, that the correction, total correction to the Green's function is just the single particle Green's function times the irreducible self energy, and then the equation repeating itself again. So in the end, you arrive at the full, at the following diagrammatic equation that is dependent only on the irreducible part of the self energy. And this is the so-called Dyson equation for G. Now, this is uh, a part of a system of five equations that you need to solve in order to determine the solution for your problem. So what are the remaining four equations? Well, you'll have the self-energy, the electronic screening describing how bosons mediate the interactions between electrons, the polarizability when you find the boson, how the bosons interact with other electrons in your system, and the electronic vertex describing how different lines recombine. Together with the equation for the Green's function, they form what we call the hidden set of equations, usually shown in this way to illustrate the interdependence between different functions. So now that we have seen how to compute the Green's function, what comes next? Well, this is going to be the topic of the next lessons. You'll see discussions on which diagram to choose depending on the system and the property that you wish to study. 
And since the school is focused on optical properties, you'll start by seeing how to correct the band gap from the FT by introducing quasi-particle corrections to the energy levels. And then you'll see that even these corrections aren't enough for you to obtain the correct optical spectra. And so you need to introduce the interaction between electrons and the holes to compute optical absorption. As a final note, I'd like to leave you with some references for books and papers where you can find full derivations and discussions of all topics that I've touched during this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.